Hello, everyone. Thank you for tuning in to learn more about the COVID-19 virus and the role of the Ohio State Wexner Medical Center during the pandemic. I'm Gail Hogan. I will be your host for the discussion this evening. A few housekeeping items before we get started. All attendees, with the exception of the panelists, are muted. The session is being recorded. It will be available within the next few days. Throughout the webinar, please submit questions for the panelists, and we will try to get to as many of those questions as we can at the end of our discussion. So let's get started. This is the fifth webinar in our series, and this week I'm privileged to have with us three experts leading Ohio State's efforts in the battle against coronavirus, from researching COVID-19 testing and vaccines, to resuming non-essential medical procedures, to the healthcare support and recovery of our communities. Let me introduce you to our panelists. Meet Dr. Daryl Gray. Dr. Gray is a physician who serves as Deputy Director of the Center for Cancer Health Equity at the Ohio State University Comprehensive Cancer Center, Medical Director of Health Communities, and Chair of the Health Equity Steering Committee. Dr. Gray has guided the Ohio, the Ohio State Health System's health equity response to COVID-19 and is co-leading the development of the Medical Center's Health Community Center on the Near East Side of Columbus. Welcome, Dr. Gray. Thank you. Next, please welcome Dr. Peter Moeller. Dr. Moeller is Chief Scientific Officer and Vice Dean for Research at the Ohio State University Wexner Medical Center and College of Medicine. Dr. Moeller is directing COVID-19 research for the Wexner Center and more than 100 different research projects focused on COVID-19 across the medical center and health sciences colleges. Welcome, Dr. Moeller. Thanks for having me. Finally, please welcome Dr. Tim Pollack. Dr. Pollack is the Chair of Surgery at the Ohio State University College of Medicine and Surgeon in Chief at Wexner Medical Center. In these roles, he leads a task force to ensure the safety of our patients, physicians, and staff during surgical procedures. During COVID-19, Dr. Pollack and his team developed a process for placing elective surgeries on a temporary hold, and then outstanding protocol was established for the new normal for surgery. Dr. Pollock's forward-thinking work places patient and clinician safety at the forefront while simultaneously allowing the sickest patients to receive the care that they need. So here's how the evening will lay out. We have a series of questions to ask each of our panelists. And then when our discussion is complete, we will open the dialogue to questions from all of you to chat. And we will limit the Q&A to about 15 minutes. Dr. Pollock, I'm gonna start with you. In okay. recent weeks, we have learned that non-emergency surgeries, procedures, diagnostic testing, and imaging, they'll resume at Ohio State. How safe is the medical center for patients and staff? So thanks, Gail. It's great to be um, with you tonight, my colleagues, and also the, the wonderful group that are joining us uh, via um, the web. So um, our hospital is very safe. It's always been safe. Um, one thing I want to emphasize is that uh, Ohio State Wexner Medical Center has always been open. We've been doing surgeries throughout the entire uh, COVID uh, pandemic. Um, and uh, when um, at the beginning of the pandemic, when we were concerned about the numbers and the potential for a surge, we definitely wound down our clinical activities and focused on doing only those essential surgeries. But we always were caring for patients um, in Columbus, in Ohio, and throughout the nation and continue to do surgery. I myself continue to operate over the last uh, you know, four to eight weeks doing operations routinely uh, in the James. We have uh, taken ex exceptional measures to ensure the safety of our patients and our providers, um, whether it be a routine screening with web-based applications, um, screening uh, our providers for any potential sy um, symptoms, um, also providing a screening at all of our entrances, um, taking uh, individuals' temperatures as they enter the uh, institution. Um, also, all um, um, providers, visitors um, are provided masks, uh, so everyone is masked in the entire uh, institution. And then there's been extensive work, uh, particularly around the perioperative areas with regards to personal protective equipment, uh, providing uh, masks, gowns, eye protection, uh, providers and uh, for patients. And then um, in addition, we have uh, implemented a pretty broad-based uh, testing uh, protocol such that um, virtually um, all of our patients who are undergoing a major surgical procedure are being routinely tested for COVID-19. So we can identify those individuals who are positive uh, for COVID-19 and make sure that they are appropriately um, um, placed in a part of the hospital that is distinct from those individuals um, who are COVID-19 uh, negative. And in fact, 
um, the entire James Cancer Hospital uh, is a COVID negative 19 zone, um, as many of our cancer patients um, are um, immunosuppressed due to the therapy that they may be receiving or the very diagnosis of, of cancer itself. So I think, uh, in fact, one of the safest places you could probably be in the entire city of Columbus is at the Ohio uh, State Wexner Medical Center. So it's business as usual, almost. <laughs> Yeah, I would say right now, um, in accordance with Governor DeWine, um, you know, we are doing uh, phase zero and phase one surgeries. And what that essentially means is that any um, essential surgery, so a surgery that is necessary for um, any type of medical ailment that may be threatening a patient's life, um, a specific organ function, um, or um, a limb, extremity, causing severe pain, or is um, significantly affecting their quality of life, then we are proceeding with those surgical operations. And as I mentioned, have been doing so from the very beginning. Um, and many of our cancer operations, in fact, have proceeded, um, as one could imagine, um, having a cancer diagnosis and, and needing a cancer operation is not really an elective procedure. Um, with regards to phase one, we are doing uh, more elective uh, operations but at this point, we are only doing elective operations that do not require an overnight stay. So if you have an elective procedure um, or uh, need a surgery, uh, we are indeed doing those. And our outpatient uh, ambulatory surgical sites, uh, whether it be at University Hospital, um, the Jameson Crane, or the Eye and the Ear Institute, um, are doing many outpatient um, elective non-essential surgeries. We are uh, preparing and we are prepared to move into phase two of surgical recovery, which is the resumption of elective surgical procedures that require an overnight stay. And we are very well positioned, we are poised, um, but we are awaiting Governor DeWine's um, um, announcement that we will be allowed to initiate those surgical procedures. And once that announcement comes, um, the Ohio State Wexner Medical Center and the James Comprehensive Cancer Center is well prepared to quickly move in that direction. Thank you. Dr. Moeller, um, what's on everyone's mind? What is the progress toward a vaccine for COVID-19? Yeah, you know, since, we've, we, since we talked last week, it's been a, a really busy week and we've started to see some really good signs for not only patients at Ohio State, but also for humankind. Um, there's some really fascinating studies that have come out that, that get at can you become immune to COVID-19? And in fact, some work that has been done in, in monkeys and in chimps has shown now, it was, a, it was a paper that was published in Science this week, that chimps that have survived COVID appear to have a resistance to being reinfected. So why is that important? Well, it means that we can develop a vaccine. And in fact, probably a lot of the folks that are on the webinar tonight have already seen that there are movement and trials toward phase one, phase two type of, of advances for vaccine development, um, which are looking very, very promising. Now, certainly as Dr. Pollack and Dr. Gray will attest, it's gonna be, it's gonna be some time because we need to make sure that they're, they're incredibly safe and that we can make sure that, that everybody gets them right. And so, um, you know, we're, we're playing a big role in that at Ohio State. Um, a, lot of, uh, a, a lot of us are working in vaccine development a lot of us are working in vaccine testing, whether that's by ourselves or with the College of Veterinary Medicine or with Battelle. So, you know, there's a lot of reason to be optimistic this week, um, even in terms of where we were last week. So it's, it's a good week. It's nice to hear something positive, I will say. It is. Yeah, it's been, you know, and again, I think it's, it's the, a lot of things are happening in Ohio State, but I think as, as both my colleagues will let you know that that it's not just about Ohio State working in a vacuum, that it's working with, with other universities and, um, and industry and our colleagues overseas to, to really make these solutions happen very, very quickly. Dr. Gray, I mentioned when I introduced you about you being um, one of the folks that is spearheading the Hem Health Community Center on the Near East Side. Can you explain what this is and an update on the progress toward opening that center? Yes, so first of all, thank you for, for having me to talk about this. It's something I'm extremely excited about. And to be honest, if we think about what uh, the Wexner Medical Center stands for, what, what, what's part of our vision and part of our mission, it's addressing Ohio's most pressing needs um, uh, and trying to build healthier communities. And so this is 
as we think about things, this is a natural fit. I mean, last webinar, for those of you who joined and tuned in, you heard Dr. Olai Wola uh, talk about the community care coach and the work that's happening through her Department of Family Medicine. This is really a complement to that work and other work that we're doing collaboratively in, in interdisciplinary fashion as well with our community, but also other stakeholders at the university and outside of the university. And so, you know, thinking about the Healthy Community Center, it is something that that we invested in as a, as a medical center back in January of 2019. And it was a building that was a landmark on the Near East Side, the MLK Library. And uh, we acquired that building in January of 2019. And it after acquiring it, it wasn't a situation where we said, oh, we're definitely going to make it to these specifications for this purpose. What happened was we had community conversations because we recognize it is very important that our community um, have input into this because if we are going to make healthier communities, they have to be part of that solution. And so we had a series of community conversations in which we heard things like, you know, we need to address food insecurity in our area. We need help with uh, understanding how to lead healthier lives uh, amidst having high blood pressure, amidst having diabetes, amidst having cancer, and dealing with these things, particularly in low-income communities and communities of color. And these are the same communities that obviously we're seeing disproportionately impacted by COVID-19. And so as we've been talking about and developing this community, healthy community center, uh, it's been very much with uh, community input. And you know, when I want to give you a kind of a insider view to uh, what a rendering looks like of this center, we'll have a picture posted in just a moment. Um, but what you'll see, what's really exciting about this center is that, and this is again, 1600 East Long Street, it's where the old MLK library was really on what one of my colleagues and partners and friends, uh, Autumn Glover terms as part of our healthy community campus. Because as many of you know, we have uh, Ohio State uh, Care Point East location there, Outpatient Care East, we have East Hospital right there. And then we have other partnerships like with the YMCA. And now we're going to have the Healthy Community Center right there in that kind of healthy community campus. So what I'm showing you here is an architectural drawing. So bear with me as I walk you through this. But it's extremely exciting because in this space, we're going to have a teaching kitchen. So many of you on uh, who are viewing may be familiar with Chef Jim Warner. He's been at the table with us helping to plan this this uh, teaching kitchen. Some of you may have been to uh, the Philip Heights Center out in New Albany and seen that kitchen they have there. This is very much built upon that premise, but it's uh, in a way of which, a way in which we can engage families from the neighborhood and have them come in, participate in cooking demonstrations to better understand how they can lead healthier lives by eating healthier, how they can prepare food still obviously on a budget but to do so to optimize preparing it in a way that can optimize the nutritional value. So this is really built around helping people to lead healthier lives. And obviously also within the, the constraints of understanding what chronic disease they may be dealing with. So obviously making healthy food similar to what Jim Warner does with his mobile kitchen and talking about how do you prepare food that's good for folks who have high blood pressure and thinking about that. But it's also, as you look at this drawing, you'll see in kind of a pinkish or a mauve color, there's, there's my fancy word for the day, mauve, uh, the, the retail uh, space. We're going to have a healthy retail space where we'll likely have um, a local vendor uh, to rent out below market rent uh, for that space. And so we have a patio outdoors so people can kind of safely physically distance and be outdoors in that space as well. Um, we have meeting rooms, so conference rooms where uh, um, local organizations can, can meet there. We can also have, obviously, uh, folks who are part of stakeholders within the Ohio State have meeting spaces. But one of the other really cool pieces about this is our fresh food market. Um, and so people can come here uh, and get fresh produce um, right from that market. And so, again, encouraging um, healthy lifestyles. Uh, we'll have a garden and likely have some, some live garden space where you can pick you know, your tomatoes or, or pick your fresh greens. Um, so this is really just a teaser for you to see some of what I find to be so exciting in engaging our communities in healthier lifestyles. This sounds very, very cool, Dr. Gray. And, and you alluded to some of the health risks of that community. Can you elaborate and also how amidst the COVID-19 um, pandemic, how you're also reaching out to this community? Yeah. So. And, and they'll put up some pictures on the screen about just different ways that we've been engaging the community even before we got to this healthy community center. It's about conversations. It's about knowing those with whom you're trying to engage because many, 
within these communities maybe maybe have medical mistrust. Maybe there's a history there where they don't necessarily trust, even though even the Ohio State University Wexford Medical Center, they have reason to not trust the health system or they haven't been connected maybe because they've been, you know, language barriers. Maybe they are new Americans and they're trying to find ways to be healthy, but I'll obviously balance other priorities. Or maybe they just don't have the resources and so they feel like engaging with the health system is just unattainable. It's not affordable. Maybe they feel as though if they engage with the program that it will be very costly. And so we've done a lot, you know, in, in actually going to communities where people reside to have programming that is accessible, that is affordable, if not free. And, you know, I think as we think about the Healthy Community Center, we're trying to address those issues that are most pressing, the food insecurity, the cancer, the hypertension, the diabetes, the obesity, and the list goes on. And in doing so, not only understanding what our tripartite mission is as a health system, which is teaching, which is research, which is clinical care, and try to bridge those things in that environment. Um, so a lot of it is uh, focused around uh, programming, cancer programming. We're not going to have you know, uh, fitness equipment in there because we have a YMCA right, right around the corner that, that we partner with. There's not going to be clinical offices in there because we have CarePoint East and the hospital right around the corner. But there's going to be a lot of space to host people and families and talking about uh, hosting educational sessions, having cooking demonstrations, but just really engaging the family and engaging communities around topics relative to healthier lifestyles. I think you're excited about this. <laughs> oh, uh, if you can't tell, I, I, I could talk about it all day. I mean, we could spend this whole <laughs> webinar talking about it. So. Well, we're going to give Dr. Pollock a chance. So. <laughs> Dr. Pollock, hey, you before, I still don't understand. I still don't understand what the mob is. <laughs> <laughs> I'm color I'm colorblind. I don't even know. I can't even see them up. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Dr. Pollock, you had mentioned that you did surgeries and others too um, during the initial part of uh, the, as the governor told everybody to shut down, there were still surgeries that were being done. What was it like for staff physically and mentally to do those surgeries during that time and for the patients as well? Yeah, sure. You know, well, Gail, I think there was, you know, as expect a lot of anxiety, um, especially as things were emerging. There's a lot of uncertainty. There was a lot of unknown. Um, I want to commend, um, you know, Dr. Paz, uh, Mr. McQuaid, um, you know, um, you know, uh, Dr. Moeller and others. I think the communication plan by the medical center was um, extremely well done. Um, I think it was incredibly important uh, during this time of uncertainty that we had a very robust communication plan, both with our patients to clearly delineate to our patients what steps we were taking as a medical center to ensure their safety. Um, and then also to have uh, open communication with our providers to share with them the emerging knowledge around COVID-19 and their risk relative to being in the operating room um, and doing procedures that perhaps were on the lungs or on the airways in particular, uh, since this is a aerosolized um, a virus, the way it spread. And so there was a lot of work done in town halls, uh, webinars like this, uh, communication um, amongst the surgeons, amongst the scientists, amongst our ID infectious disease colleagues, our epidemiologists. And I think it was just a really proud moment um, because everyone really came together. And uh, that's what I think makes some Ohio State really special is the teamwork, um, the collaboration um, that we can bring to bear when we're um, faced with challenges like this. And so we quickly moved to put into place a number of different protocols. A lot of my time was spent working um, with a different recovery groups to come up with specific protocols about how we would handle um, uh, a COVID-19 positive patient, um, let's say who needed an operation. Um, we identified specific operating rooms that we would only use for COVID-19 positive patients. So we could make sure that we were not having patients who were COVID-19 negative be in the same um, space as patients who were COVID-19 positive. We spent a lot of time talking about what type of personal uh, protective equipment would be necessary for these um, procedures. And I think another great success that Dr. Mola had her big hand in was the whole um, a story around uh, N95 masks. And for uh, those of you who may or may not know, these are special masks that are specially fitted for individuals who are interacting with patients, especially those patients who are, uh, potentially have COVID-19 or have COVID-19 that are specifically designed to help prevent the spread of the virus. 
And as you can imagine, as this was emerging, these masks were in relatively low supply and that impacted our ability to do some of the procedures and surgeries that we needed to get done because there was only a limited amount of these masks and personal protective equipment. But just another example of the ingenuity and the collaboration that actually Dr. Moeller le uh, led between Ohio State and one of our community partners, Battelle, was the whole process um, around um, reprocessing these masks such that we could use these masks not one time, but now up to 20 times. And that was a real game changer uh, because it allowed us to have more inventory of these masks, more inventory of this personal uh, protective equipment. And this facilitated all of our providers um, to be more able to treat our patients and to feel safe in doing so. Um, so it's been an incredible journey and an incredible demonstration of just what Buckeye Nation can do when uh, really faced with some um, uh, difficult times. Dr. Mueller, to more science, uh, it's my understanding that OSU performs 5,000 COVID-19 tests a day, conduct approximately um, 1,200 at that point too. I mean, as that's what the hope is. So as businesses and daycares go back, many are waiting to hear about schools. Where are we with, with testing? And what are your thoughts of being able to test everybody in Ohio? Right. So, so a really good question. And I think something that we, we hear a lot. Um, so at, at OSU, you know, we were one of the first out of the gates in terms of testing. And I think we've tested almost 45,000 individuals, um, which is incredible. Um, we are now starting to move forward with um, toward antibody testing or serology testing, which will allow you to see, have you been infected before? And probably there's a lot of us that if we think back to January and February, hmm, maybe I was, maybe I was, I had something then. And so we're just starting to roll that out now. So I think Buckeye Nation will start to hear about that a little bit more. Um, the question of does everybody need to get tested um, is something that we, we hear a lot. And I just, just for the people on the, on, on the webinar tonight, remember that the COVID test, the RNA test is, is sort of a one, is a snapshot in time, meaning that Gail, I could test you tonight and I could tell you that you're virus free, but tomorrow you could go out with your, at the grocery store and, and get it. So that's only good for one day. Where it's very effective, as Dr. Pollack mentioned, is pre-surgeries, um, both for the patient as well as the healthcare worker. And so that's being deployed. You'll also see that we're, we're starting to see more of that in terms of looking at um, prevalence in um, community centers or nursing homes or <laughs> you know, veterans homes. And so it's another way to look at that. But, but really it's, it's testing is, is really the central backbone of our ability to respond. And that's gonna mean both COVID testing, antibody testing, being able to track and, and look for other people in the community. I think another big key is making sure it's available for everyone, right? And so not just beyond people that are getting surgery at Ohio State, but Dr. Gray and his team have led some really ex exciting things that are happening in, in the community to allow other people to get tested. And he mentioned that a little bit earlier, but, but I think as we continue to test, continue to expand our capacity, that we, we have a strategy that, that everybody has access so we can make really good decisions going forward as, as, as a population. Uh, we are moving ahead. Uh, I would just like to remind everyone who's listening and, and with us this evening to submit your questions because we're gonna get to those in a few moments. <clears throat> Dr. Gray, I'm gonna go back to you for a moment. Um, to provide increased access to this testing that Dr. Muller just talked about, um, there's a new location, a community-based location at KIPP Columbus, and that was developed. And this site borders zip codes where residents tend to be more vulnerable to the virus, socioeconomic status, housing characteristics, underlying chronic health conditions. What's been the response of opening up this testing site? You know, first, I have to thank Dr. Moeller personally via this webinar because, you know, had it not been for some of the things that he, the efforts that he has led in regards to expanding our ability to create tests, to have the reagent to uh, process the test, et cetera, then we would not be able to uh, have the capacity to offer testing in the community in the way in, the way in which we are now. And to his latter comment, you know, part of what we have tried to do is to ensure that everyone who needs to get a test has access to testing. And, and so I've been, you know, fortunate to partner with 
uh, different people like Dr. Moeller, Dr. Andy Thomas, and so many others from our Health Equity Steering Committee to uh, Obesity and Nutrition Committee to uh, even uh, community organizations such as the National African American Male Wellness Initiative, not only to get the word out about the importance of testing and how they can go about getting testing, but then launching new sites. So most recently, we've launched the site that you just mentioned at KIPP Columbus. And it's the response that we've received has been outstanding. I mean, people are just very much appreciative of the opportunity to get tested. But not only that, we've also, as we expand to this new site, we expanded our criteria. So as, you, as some people on the webinar may recall, not only did you have to have symptoms, but you may have had to fall into an age category or have a comorbidity like a diabetes or, or, or cancer um, to get testing. But now we're able to test and we have the capacity, again, credit to Dr. Moeller, our entire lab staff uh, as well, that we have the capacity to test all people who have symptoms, uh, who call in uh, the line to, to, to get tested. And, and we're happy to be able to do that. But again, this would not be possible without partnerships, Part partnerships at the Ohio State University Wexford Medical Center, partnerships in the community, and just investment from our leadership uh, to get this done. I'm, I'm incredibly thankful, particularly to Dan Bachman, Dr. Dan Bachman and his team, who've been leading the swabbing stations. I'm thankful to um, the Department of Family Medicine, who takes the community care coach to these sites um, as well. Uh, I'm thankful to Dr. Joshua Joseph and his leadership. He and I have helped to put some in, Autumn Glover, who I mentioned earlier, put some of these proposals together that, again, would not be possible without uh, executive leadership support. Dr. Moeller, real quick, uh, can you differentiate between the antibody and diagnostic, te diagnostic testing? The difference in do we need both? Sure. So um, I'll, get, I'll get super nerdy for you again, Gail. So the COVID RNA test is the test that, that Dr. Gray was just talking about, where they'll stick something in your nose and test to see you if you have active virus. That's the PCR or molecular test. And that looks at the foreign agent inside of you. The antibody test is actually looking at your response as a human to having the virus. So your, your body's immune system will secrete or excrete things called antibodies, which then whether you have the flu or whether you have COVID or whether you have a, a cold, will then go in and attack, right? They'll attack the virus. So what these antibody tests do is that they're measuring whether you have been infected with something. Um, it's very different to say that you've been infected with something and then you've been infected with COVID. And so what we've been working on at Ohio State, and again, a lot of this is because of support from people on probably on the call tonight, is working to make sure that the titer of those antibodies or the amount of these antibodies correlates with what we call neutralizing antibodies, which are the, the very specific little antibodies in your body that attack the virus. And so we've gotten that done now, and we feel very comfortable with the accuracy and the specificity of our test to move forward. So the answer is we need both. We need both because Tim Pollack, who's on the line, has to be able to know that his patients are virus-free to be able to do surgeries. We also be, need to be able to know for surveillance or prevalence testing in the community of how many people have had it. And so how quickly can we get some of the, these things going in the community to be able to understand, are we immune? Can we develop vaccines? It's, so it's both of them are absolutely critical. I got it. Actually, I do. <laughs> Thanks, Dr. Moeller. Dr. Pollock, uh, telemedicine, telehealth, that has come to the forefront at Ohio State and other places, so much so because of COVID. So where do you see that now? in the future now that we've established and maybe patients are kind of getting used to this idea. Yeah, I think that's been one of the areas that, um, you know, really has been a dramatic change. I mean, if you look at the number of telehealth visits that we were doing as an institution pre-COVID, it was extremely low. And even in my own practice, uh, it was zero. Um, I, I didn't really <laughs> practice any telehealth um, medicine at all. Um, now, right now, my entire clinic is telehealth, televideo, telephonic, um, and we are doing thousands of uh, televideo and telehealth visits um, because of COVID-19. I want to emphasize, though, that you know our clinics are open now. We're running our clinics at about 50% um, due to social distancing. And we have a clinic recovery group. And we are working on putting process procedures in place so that we can get up to about 75%, hopefully within the next week or so, and then hopefully back to 100% capability to welcome patients back into our clinics by mid-June. That being said, Gail, I think your point is well taken. 
Uh, many patients have really liked telehealth visits and televideo visits. Um, frequently, in particular, for follow-up visits, myself being a cancer doctor, frequently I may have operated on a patient. I see all my patients on a routine basis, you know, every year after their cancer operation to see how they're doing, check their scans. And frequently, many patients like to have a telehealth visit for that. Um, they can get the scan closer to home. I can see the scan because it can easily be transferred to our institution. I can review the scan on my computer, and then we can have a televideo conversation about the results of the scan. I can ask how they're doing, um, and they can avoid the um, parking um, at Ohio State. So I think moving forward, we'll see that there will be a more generalized adoption of uh, telehealth and telemedicine um, more broadly, even post-COVID. And in fact, um, we recently published a paper on this, um, and it's recently been published. You can Google my name and telemedicine um, online, and the paper will come up looking exactly um, the transformation in telehealth and telemedicine at Ohio State um, because of the COVID-19 uh, epidemic. Dr. Gray, what does the Healthy Community Center um, say about Ohio State's investment in the health of its community? Because this is something that is not on the main campus. This is obviously something that has moved into the neighborhood. That's right. I think it, it shows a commitment to community health. It shows a commitment to um, creating healthier communities, but with community input. And not, it's not about us being the ivory tower and taking our recommendations into the community, but it's really listening to the community and then building off of that. And so, you know, none of this will be possible without many people who are on this webinar tonight. Um, and so I just want to thank those who have donated to the many efforts that we've been doing, particularly in a trying time such as we're facing right now during COVID-19. Um, to donate means a lot. And, you know, I think about efforts that we just came through and Dr. Olai Wola, I'm sure highlighted this on her webinar, but we just came through a period where we gave out 10,000 community care kits. And in those kits were masks. We gave out 46,000 masks across uh, Franklin County for people trying to get back on their feet, get back to work. And that's in large part to generous donations. And as we think about the Healthy Community Center, you know, us getting to the finish line is gonna be because of a lot of generous donations uh, to help get us there. And it makes a difference. You know, when we see people uh, coming into the community and receiving kits, for example, and what I envision in my mind is I see people walking into the Healthy Community Center and learning, working with Chef Jim Warner, cutting up vegetables with their family, learning how to prepare them. As I envision people coming into the conference space, community organization, hosting meetings there, people coming in to get the fresh produce. I'm also gonna be thinking about all the people who donated to that. And, and I just thank Buckeye Nation for just being such a big part of our success in engaging the community and making healthier communities. Dr. Muller, I know you feel the same way because we have talked about this previously, what philanthropy has been able to do for your research projects, but the research projects that extend worldwide. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think all three of us feel the same way, and I know I speak for the rest of my colleagues, is that, that the trust of, of Buckeye Nation in you know, what we've been doing has allowed us to move incredibly quickly to to do things that are saving lives every day and and things where you know you may not think about the impact of a test or getting something out to a neighborhood that doesn't have testing or being able to do um, testing or or diagnostics or whatever it may be before a surgery um, the the buckeye nation's changing changing the world and and i think beyond what's happening in our local campus um, setting sort of a, a bar for, for what's happening around the world of how do people work together. And, and it's just been, um, it's just been very exciting to, to, be, to be able to watch. And, and I, again, I, I think that the other thing I wanna remind folks on the call is, is that all this is happening while everything else is continuing. And so whether you're, you know, you're someone that's supported Pelotonia that is interested in, in cancer research or people that Say, say that you're someone out there tonight that has lung disease or you've had a transplant. There are people that are continuing to work every day on, on lung disease and IPF and electrophysiology for people that might have heart disease. So all of these things are happening, as Dr. Pollock said, on top. It wouldn't happen if, if, it, if it wasn't for the support from the people on, on the call tonight and, and, and the rest of Buckeye Nation. We're just 
while, while there's three of us on the call tonight, we're speaking for our colleagues, but but really on behalf of everybody that's that's that supported us. Can I, follow, Paul, can can I, I just follow up on that point, Gail? I just Please. I think that's so important because obviously COVID nineteen is so important and, and and is like clearly our number one priority in our focus. Yet as Dr. Moeller pointed, I mean people still have cancer, they still have cardiac disease, they still have you know a, a, all these other ailments that we every day are trying to treat uh, patients. And I am so grateful to our donors because many of our clinician scientists during this time are particularly vulnerable um, due to you know, what's going on just with the economy, with funding of, of our researchers. And it's just so important that our clinicians are adequately resourced to continue to do the cutting edge research that needs to be done to find the next treatment for cardiac disease, cancer, um, pulmonary disease, and it's really the generosity of all of you that make that uh, possible. We need to fight COVID. We need to get through this. Um, but at the same time, we are still treating underlying diseases in the COVID setting. I'm still <laughs> taking out that pancreatic cancer in the COVID-19 pandemic. We're still treating that patient with aneurysmal uh, or vascular disease amidst the COVID-19 pandemic and making sure that we are still focused on um, cutting edge research in those areas um, due to your support and thanks to your support is obviously uh, still uh, critically important and I'm incredibly grateful for that. Yes, because all the other diseases don't take a pause, <laughs> unfortunately. There are still lots of things that people are dealing with. This is a question first to Dr. Moeller and then maybe Dr. Gray and Dr. Pollock, you may wanna follow up as well. And um, the question is, Hearing you all makes me, the person who wrote this question, makes me more comfortable that our society is heading in the right direction. Is there anything that should alert us to future problems? Well, you know, I, I think, um, I guess I, as a scientist, I feel the data that's starting to come out of some of these clinical trials and some of the, the preclinical animal model tests make me feel a whole lot better about the future of 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 humankind and and getting through this this pandemic i think there's a lot that we have to learn um and i think it's being better prepared um for the next pandemic you know as as the world continues to to warm and and you know people become living on top of each other a little bit more I think, you know, being able to respond quickly and whether that's getting testing up faster, whether that's um, working together better across boundaries, um, you know, I think we've learned a lot and, and this is going to go away. It doesn't seem like it, but it's going to get, it's going to be minimized. I think we just can't, we can't lose sight of, of the lessons that we've learned and whether that's working together to support communities or you know, communicating across lines. You know, we've talked a lot about researchers tonight, which I love, which is awesome, but but we've not talked about all the people on the on the back line. So the people in legal and HR and the nurses and the staff and you know everybody that's really come together. We need to make sure, and probably everybody on the call tonight is seeing the same things in their own businesses or their own lives. We need to continue that community of people working together um, once COVID's over because it makes the world move a lot faster. Dr. Gray or Dr. Pollock? I can't make, I can't say anything that's better than that. <laughs> no, I, I think we just have to, like Dr. Mueller said, we just have to continue to work together. I think, you know, as, as we are seeing businesses open and we're also seeing headlines and images of folks who are not physically distancing or not wearing masks and who are congregating in mass numbers, um, I think we all just have to do our best to stay safe and to educate others, whether they be our neighbor, our community members, our friends, our family, just do our best to educate on what we're learning through webinars just like this about how to stay safe, but also how to engage with those communities who have difficulty doing so. So we talk about communities and, and particularly we focus sometimes on um, um, vulnerable populations. As we think about vulnerable populations, you know, we have to think about those who may not be able to physically distance because they live in multi-generational households or people who are essential workers, they're the bus driver and, and so they're exposed to a lot of people. We have to think about how we can keep all of those people safe during this time as we're opening up and just spreading the message in ways that people can understand. And so I'm so thankful, and not only for the supporters on the line, but also those who are engaging with us, who help us to do translation of materials. 
for those who are new Americans and those who have limited English proficiency. Um, all those people on the front line. So, so thank you. I think everybody can be a part of the solution. And I think even, you know, all the folks who are on the line on this webinar today have a part to play, whether it's calling their neighbor, calling their sister or brother and saying, hey, I learned this today. Um, I think it's all very helpful in navigating this time. I do have a comment. This isn't a question from someone who's watching the webinar. This person says, being involved in operations at a community hospital, I appreciate and am grateful for all the clinical and support staff and the connection to the OSU Wexner Medical Center um, and the state and local public health departments as well. You collectively give us community. So I would assume that that is a one of those other community hospitals with ties, which people may not realize, Dr. Paula, there are ties from Ohio State to outlying community hospitals. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, I've participated, Dr. Thomas and others have participated, you know, with the Ohio um, Hospital Association. Um, there have been routine phone calls um, among all the leaders of all the different hospitals in the state. It's been extremely collaborative, not only here at the Ohio State Wexner Medical Center, um, but amongst all the hospitals, not only in Columbus, but throughout the entire state. Um, and really, um, everyone came together to focus all of their efforts, whether it be around, um, you know, how we were going to um, utilize pe uh, personal protective equipment and, um, you know, uh, sharing stocks of personal protective equipment and things like that. And I think it's also important to emphasize that, indeed, this has not um, only been a physician uh, effort. Um, I think the other thing that I'd like to call out is that at our medical center, we have very purposely had broad engagement um, from um, physicians, from nurses, um, from our um, advanced uh, practice providers, from staff, um, and from a data analytics team and our administrative team. It's really been um, everyone across the board has come together to uh, provide um, a real collaborative uh, teamwork uh, effort to get this done. Dr. Moeller, a question for you. Some of us know people who have been sick, but they have not been tested for COVID-19, so they don't know if they ever had it. So how are the state stats accurate, or are they still guessing? <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a bit of a loaded question, but, but I'll, <laughs> I'll give it a whack. Um, so, so I think probably what we've, we've learned is that, um, uh, you know, if you see one state's results, you see one state's results. And um, whether people overreport or underreport, um, you know, the, the big goal is, as Dr. Pollock mentioned, is to get the get the right test in the right hands. And and while you could give a test to everybody, and you know, if we gave a test to everybody in, in Ohio, we'd have eleven point seven million tests done. Is that the best use of resources? Is that the best use of our you know, our healthcare worker staff, um, you know, every time you test, you know, and you were to drive out and get a test, you know, you're at potential risk of being infected and, and likewise for the person that's doing it. So I think our state, um, you know, we, we want to be able to test more. And I think our governor has been saying that over and over. And we've been working in, in science and across the medical center, as well as other medical centers across the state to increase that. Testing is one, one of many pillars. Um, but things like that we heard from Dr. Gray of temperature checks, hand washing, um, PPE, um, just just equally as important and and not as technically so challenging. <laughs> so it's one piece. Um, numbers are important, but strategy I would say trumps the numbers um, every day. I don't know, Dr. Pollock or Dr. Gray, what your thoughts are on that? I agree wholeheartedly. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that we are out of time, gentlemen, this evening. Thank you all very much, Dr. Gray, Dr. Moeller, Dr. Pollock. Thank you for your time this evening. And thank you all out there for joining us. And I hope you will join us next time for the up-to-the-minute information about COVID-19 from the front lines. If you are interested in ways to help, please visit the website on the screen and join Ohio State in the fight against the coronavirus. We thank you again. Be safe, be well, and everyone have a good evening. Thank you.